so good. Mm. I don't have any more. No, no more, no more, no more. Look, look, nothing. Sorry. Twenty Twenty's Monster Hunter is a new survival movie about Joel, who sets out on a dangerous journey across a monster-infested world to... Oh, wrong one. Twenty Twenty's Monster Hunter is a new survival movie about Captain, who sets out on a dangerous journey across a monster-infested world to get back home. As in, it's pretty much the exact same movie as Love and Monsters that we covered not too long ago, except just more of a big Hollywood spectacle blockbuster version of it. Which in practice can mean a few different things, but mostly just one thing. Joking aside, this doesn't necessarily mean this movie isn't worth checking out for yourself, because it does have some good stuff in it as well. The budget here is double that of Love and Monsters, and at times you can definitely see that. Some of the monster work itself here is handled as effectively as I've ever seen it handled, and Mila Jovovich, for example, does do a great job at what she's meant to do. So if you're looking for a dumb, fun way to spend 100 minutes, you might very well enjoy what you see. But I'd say that's also the film's biggest restrictive problem that prevents it from becoming a anything more. The fact that even though you might enjoy what you see, you're not gonna feel any of it. You're not gonna remember it for anything beyond just the visuals, if at all. As in, pretty on the outside, nothing on the inside. A much inferior version of its counterpart. Because even though Love and Monsters was a pretty small production, it still did a few massive monster-related things to leave a lasting emotional impact on the audience, to make itself more than just another dumb, loud Hollywood survival movie. And if Monster Hunter would've only had time to learn those lessons and do the same things, I guarantee you 100% it would have been a much better movie overall. And that's the plan for today, to compare Monster Hunter to Love and Monsters and find out what it is it's missing, why it feels like a dumb lower class version of the same movie, in a way that you'll forget 10 minutes after watching. Here's what you not only should, but kinda have to keep in mind when making a monster movie. Firstly, the thing that made Love and Monsters so emotionally immersive was the fact that our hero Joel was the wrong person to face the monsters. Joel had such a strong chronic fear of monsters it made him freeze every time he saw one, and so most likely he wouldn't last one mile outside. You can't handle it, Joel. You should. You're a liability. But he still chose to go on his journey anyway because his motivation was so incredibly strong. And that's why we cared about his journey. That's why we were so genuinely amazed when he overcame the monster obstacles of the journey. What if I have uh, terrible instincts? You'll die. <laughs> But in Monster Hunter, all of this is the opposite. The motivation aspect, for example, is non-existent. Basically, our hero captain is a captain of an army ranger squad who gets accidentally thrusted into an alternate dimension infested by gigantic deadly monsters, and then develops an ultimate goal of getting back home. There's nothing inherently wrong with this goal itself, but the real issue is that there's no established reason to achieve it. Whereas in Love and Monsters, Joel had this extremely strong motivation to reach his old girlfriend because he just couldn't go on wasting his life without living anymore, here that motivation doesn't exist. The only tiny hint at motive comes when Captain has escaped the spider nest and then notices her wedding ring, which indicates that there is a person waiting for her. But then we never get any more insight into who that person is, or what they mean to her, or why she needs to get back to them in the first place. And so overall, Captain's motivation to go home rests mostly on the fact that that's what you do when stuck in an alternate monster-infested world, I guess. Which is why we don't really care about her journey, which is why even she ultimately cares so little about it that before she's even reached that person, she already pulls a last and now wants to go back to the monster world to become a monster hunter. We have to get back. 
We have to shut the Sky Tower down. So you're saying your motive to get home to your family was just artificial talk and not actually a real thing you need to actually accomplish in this movie? Copy that. <laughs> And on the other side of the problem is the fact that Captain is exactly the right person to navigate a world of monsters. Not only is she an army ranger, she's the top ranger, which by nature means she's very skilled. I've never seen a flamethrower do this to a man. Not even napalm burns that hot. What we do best, we fight and we survive. No matter what the odds. Captain knows what she's doing, all right? I do want to give credit though that the movie does do a fantastic job of establishing the danger of this world and making our hero vulnerable. See, right after the squad has entered this dimension, Captain is holding this heroic speech about them being soldiers meant for this when... But aside from this one incredibly effective spider sequence, this movie does suffer badly from an overpowered hero. Whereas Joel at first was barely surviving with the help of others, Captain is so inherently skilled that she never needs any help at all to survive. She escapes the spider prison for no established reason other than I guess she's so tough that even giant spider venom can't keep her down. She can put up a real fight against a local native when she's badly injured, even beating him next time and then having to save his life instead of the other way around. She's tough, she's skilled, she by nature is the perfect monster hunter, which takes away from the suspenseful immersion of whether or not she's actually gonna make it out alive. The whole point of Love and Monsters was that Joel had to learn the skills necessary in order to survive the monster world. And in Monster Hunter, that whole point is gone because Captain already possesses those skills. Why learn to shoot when you're already a perfect shot? And I guarantee that if only this movie had made Captain the least equipped person for the monster job like in Love and Monsters, it would have been a stronger experience. If for example she'd been a new recruit with a chronic fear of spiders, someone who isn't yet so skilled and needs help and growth to survive this world of spiders on her own, we would have been more immersed in her journey of survival. Because if a hero is just the right person to face a world of monsters to the point where there's no apparent chance they might not survive and with no no real motivations either, then what is there for us to care about and immerse ourselves into? Secondly, the way Love and Monsters created a sense of emotional investment was by creating an emotional connection between Joel and this world of monsters. Basically, we get this flashback showing that Joel lost his parents during the monster outbreak, which now means that he's not fighting just random CGI monsters. He's fighting physical representations of this world that took away his family, the world that's about to take away his new family. No. Whereas in Monster Hunter, sadly, we spend a hundred minutes fighting random CGI monsters that carry absolutely no meaning to our hero or us beyond their CGI appearances. As an example, a big part of the movie takes place at this mountain base where Captain has to evade and survive this one hive-like pack of giant spiders, which visually, aesthetically, is very effective, especially with 4K HDR where the blacks are actually black. But visual appearance aside, it doesn't change the fact that at the end of the day, all these CGI spiders are, are just CGI spiders, nothing more. And they could have been so much more if this movie had only taken a page from Love and Monsters and added in a series of flashbacks to connect them to our hero. I know flashbacks can have a bad reputation for breaking momentum, but here we have multiple time jumps between day and night which break it anyway. And I'd say this movie is in desperate need of more story meat because most of the time we're just sitting around waiting. because. Other Otherwise, we'd be repeating the same scenes back to back. So in essence, the main idea with the spiders seems to be that they need living beings to hatch their parasitic eggs into in order for the race to survive, which again, visually, is pretty damn effective.
Okay, so maybe this is something we could use and build on in the flashbacks. Maybe the flashbacks tell a story of a genetic cancer-like parasite that devoured Captain's mom's body to survive. Maybe they tell a story of how that same genetic parasite tried to devour her body and maybe now even her daughter's body or something. Point is, this way when Captain is fighting the CGI spiders that need her body to survive, she's not fighting just random CGI spiders. She's fighting physical representations of that genetic cancer-like disease that took her mother, the disease that tried to take her and is now trying to take her daughter. I'm not saying this is the right answer here and it wouldn't really work for the rest of the monsters, but the point is that this way our fight against the spiders carries real emotional weight beyond just what we see visually. We're also fighting our most inner demons existing within their CGI shells. And again, whether you like this specific example or not, I guarantee you 100% that it would have given this movie a stronger sense of emotional investment and made the whole thing a lot better. Because now we're fighting sand monsters and dragons that mean absolutely nothing to us beyond them being sand monsters and dragons. They can visually look exciting and cool, but they still feel emotionally hollow because that's what they are, just random hollow CGI monstrosities. Joel wasn't fighting just any monsters, he was fighting not to let this world steal the same thing it already once stole. And that's what you want for your monster movie as well. Whatever your monster or monsters are, identify something tragic in your hero's past that the monsters can inherit inside them and become metaphorical representations of. Because otherwise the monsters we see can and will come off as emotionally empty. Finally, Love and Monsters also did a great job at avoiding boring staleness by adding variety to each of the monster encounters, with either increased difficulty or thematic representation. The increased difficulty side essentially means that every new encounter has been set up to be more dangerous and taxing than the last. When Joel alone is facing a giant worm, that worm is the queen of the smaller worms that almost killed him earlier on if there hadn't been others there to save him, which now clearly separates this encounter from all earlier ones in terms of perceived challenge. What you saw were worker bees. What you want to avoid under all circumstances is a queen. But in Monster Hunter, the danger level doesn't really rise. There is some setup work like with the Sand Monster for example. In the beginning, we barely escape it, which by logic does make it seem more formidable in the second encounter. But the issue is that the second encounter isn't really more difficult in any way. It's not like anything has changed to make things worse. The only real difference is that this time Captain is prepared and joined by a skilled ally. And with the dragon, for example, there is no proper setup at all. There is one quick glimpse of it earlier on, but the threat there doesn't really purposefully come from the dragon itself, but from these other creatures. And so ultimately, the only reason for us to view the dragon as a big deal is because it's a CGI dragon. The only thing set up for us about it is mostly its weakness. Almost impossible to kill. Their only weakness is just before they breathe fire. Remember, they're weak just before they breathe fire. I mean, the only real variety in difficulty here comes from the fact that everything gets easier. Like I said, the most challenging section of the movie comes right near the beginning when we get attacked by the spiders and then have to find a way to escape their nest, which is very effectively challenging. But after that, everything else feels like smooth sailing. When Captain realizes the spiders fear light, it's not like she now has to find a way off the mountain base before sunset. Instead, she now gets taken in by the native to safely camp out the nights. Are we trying to get in here, huh? When she has to kill a spider for its venom to use against a sand monster, it's not like there's anything special about that spider compared to the full hive. Instead, it's just one random spider and by comparison, not that big a deal. So in other words, because this movie peaks in difficulty early on, every later monster encounter begins to blur together in terms of perceived challenge, which in turn begins to turn them into interchangeable, boring, blurry noise. 
On the thematic representation side, although the final boss in Love and Monsters hasn't been set up to be more difficult, the movie makes up for this by having that final boss embody its main thematic message. The message that even though this is a world of monsters, that doesn't mean every monster in this world is an evil being that we can survive only by killing. There can be nice ones? You can always tell in their eyes. You can always tell in the eyes. What are you doing? Shoot it! Shoot it! What are you waiting for? And with Monster Hunter, this is a very big problem. The finale fight here is against the dragon, which carries no thematic meaning beyond that whatsoever. We fight a CGI dragon, we kill the CGI dragon, roll credits. Then there's also another dragon they promoted in the marketing that we never actually fight. And the result is a bunch of loud computer-generated noise that you'll remember about as long as the finale of the last Bayformers movie. Which is a bummer, cause by copying Love and Monsters, it could've been so much more. Like building on our earlier hypothetical spider flashback example, maybe the finale battle could've been something like this. After jumping through the portal back into her own world, Captain now meets her husband and daughter who have come with the army from their home base to search for her after she went missing. But just when things look to be over, one big spider from before now shows up through the portal to kill all the soldiers and then try to kill Captain's daughter. Not because it's a big bad CGI spider, but because, as we now realize, that lone spider Captain killed before for Venom was its child. As in, in the world of monsters, the mother spider isn't actually a monster. Captain is the one who invaded its home. Captain is the one who killed its child. In that alternate dimension, Captain is the monster and the mother spider the monster hunter. And it traveled the exact same impossible journey as us just to take from us the thing we took from it. Unless our hero mother can stop that. Or it can be any monster you want, as long as we met it in place of the spiders so that it represents our inner demons. Again, maybe this doesn't make any sense without first rewriting the context of the rest of the movie, because currently the monsters are just monsters, but you get the point. The point that this way, the finale would be something very thematically specific, which separates it from every other monster encounter. And honestly, I'm pretty sure this already would be better than just tossing the spiders away altogether. Better than fighting a random fire dragon by shooting it it with more fire. And this, combined with the earlier points, is why I would argue that Monster Hunter is a dumb lower tier popcorn version of Love and Monsters. So much so, that when choosing which you want your monster movie to be, these are the key aspects you make that choice with.